Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce our panel today. We have our presenter, Rich Falco, coming from his home in Florida. Uh, just below Rich on the screen is Pete. Pete Orlando, Pete works with us at the Research Center as a senior curriculum developer. At the bottom of the page, uh, not intentionally, is Jim Kakonis. You've seen Jim before if you've attended our webinars. And then of course we have Jeff Miller. Jeff Miller is our technology manager for CTI and he keeps all the loose ends tied up for us. So thanks for that, Jeff. I'm Randy Briggs. I'm manager of the uh, CTI Research and Development Center and I'm really fortunate to have a team like this to work with. So uh, it's all good. Uh, welcome to our webinar. If you're a return guest, uh, that's awesome. If this is the first time, I'd like to walk through a couple of things with you. Uh, in regard to CTI online and some of the tools that will be in your Zoom meeting uh, right now. What you're seeing now is my browser at, uh, and we're at uh, ctionline.com. If you log into this first time during the day, you're gonna see this little splash panel come up. Uh, if you close that, you're gonna get to our main public page. If you want to see uh, not only upcoming webinar training or register for that training or see recorded videos the week after the live event, we want to hover our mouse over training. You'll see a little drop down come up and click on virtual classroom. When you click on virtual classroom, you'll see this table come up. So select the topic that you want, the day and time that works for you register over here. You do have to pre-register for these, by the way. And we do repeat the same topic uh, three times during the week. So that helps guys out in different time zones, different work requirements, and hopefully everybody gets a shot at attending. The recordings are listed at the bottom of that page. And all you have to do is click on video and it will take you right to that video. So uh, after today's webinar, you'll see the recording for uh, application of electrical test tools populate right under that. So should be in good shape. It, it won't populate today though. It'll no, it won't populate early, today. Early next week, right? Yep. Okay. Yep, exactly, exactly. There we go. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for being here. I uh, appreciate you taking time out of your day to uh, spend an hour with us, your, your lunch or, or work or whatever it may be. Uh, our, our discussion today, application of electrical test tools, this is normally an eight-hour class that, that I do as I'm traveling around my normal regions. So in this class, we do assume you guys have some basic understanding of um, of electricity, electrical circuits. Uh, I'm gonna ask you some questions. I will tell you, you guys are our guinea pigs for our polls. We're gonna put some polls up where you can answer some questions. It is anonymous. We are not uh, keeping your names. We're gonna call anybody out for being wrong. We just wanna see, uh, track how we're doing here uh, with some of, our, some of our questions. But uh, this class focuses on what tools are available, uh, what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are. If you are not good with electrical and at every shop I've ever worked at, I've had a coworker say to me, ah, that, that electrical stuff just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, you, can, you can keep that stuff. We, we don't really have that option anymore. We, we have to understand electrical. And I really hope if I get to do more webinars, we'll do a lot more um, electrical fundamentals and testing classes like this so we can get you guys up to speed because uh, cars aren't getting any less complicated and we need to understand the circuit we need to understand what our tools can or cannot do uh, and, and that's really what our our conversation today is uh, <laughs> not so much hey this tool is a waste of money but this tool does these things very well uh, but it it, it can't perform this test and we, we have to go somewhere else for that. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna jump into that here. But first I wanna ask everybody a question. I see a lot of people talking on the chat and hello to guys in South Africa and Colorado and Philly and, and Jersey. Um, but um, I wanna ask you guys a question and you can just answer with a yes or a no or a, or a me. Uh, how many of you guys have performed an electrical test 
uh, you used a jumper wire, you've hooked up a test light, you've got a multimeter, an amp clamp, a scope, whatever it is, and gotten results that made no sense to you. Got something that didn't work out like you expected. Yeah, we're getting a whole lot of yeses and me's. Yeah, perfect. And, and Jose, I hope I'm saying that right, Jose. It, yeah, it happens to all of us. Two days ago, I, and I said this in the Wednesday class, I got a Jeep that's kicking my butt. And part of the problem was I wasn't setting the scope up right. I wasn't super familiar with the scope. I was at a shop using their tools. And, and uh, the majority of the problem was user error. It, it was I didn't get the strengths and weaknesses of that particular scope and, and, and their tools. Uh, <clears throat> so, oh, I'm sorry, guys. One second here. Here we go. So uh, as we go through this class here, um, we want to try and clear up some of that. We want to try and uh, uh, make sure we understand the tools we're using and how to use them and uh, what tests are, are best for what particular tool. Come on. So we want to test, not guess. We don't want to. Uh, we don't want to just uh, load up the parts can and throw throw things at it and and uh, return what doesn't fix it and hope for the best because uh, sooner or later somebody's whether it's our customer or our part supplier is going to get sick of supplying us with test equipment. Uh, <clears throat> performing a test and just about any test is better than just throwing parts at it. But if we're performing a test and we don't know the limitations of our tool, we might go in the wrong direction. We might get uh, some bad information and and waste a lot of time chasing a problem that maybe is or isn't there. So I want to say this right up front because uh, not everybody in the in the world has a scope. Uh, not everybody in the world has every snap-on tool known to mankind. And I'm one of those guys that used to make fun of Harbor Freight multimeters and tell you, you know, any multimeter is good unless it says Harbor Freight on it. But if you know the specs, if you know what it can do, then then you know what you can handle with that particular tool. It, it doesn't matter the name brand. It doesn't matter where it came from. If you have a mastery of that that particular tool and understand what it can give you from a test light to a scope, then, then you're doing just fine there. And the only way you're going to get good with any test tool you have is to take it out and play with it as much as possible. And I'm talking about the tools here. Uh, make a dyad cart. I don't have a bay that I work in anymore. I'm, I, I have a van I drive around, and all my stuff is mobile. Uh, so I, I don't have that ability to build that dyad cart. To get the, the cheapest Harbor Freight or grab that cart at the back of the shop and throw a laptop on it, throw your scope on it, throw your multimeter on it, hang all of your leads off the side of it, and make it as easy as possible to do this test. The only way you're going to know if you're missing something is if you actually perform a test and see for yourself, oh, oh my multimeter can't catch that, or I had it on the wrong settings, or I was, I was hooked up improperly. So practice, practice, practice. Make it convenient. The worst thing you can do is buy a brand new tool and uh, throw it in the bottom of your toolbox and say, I can't wait for a broken car to come in. I get, I get beat up in my classes for saying, um, collect known goods, practice on known good cars. And, 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 and rightfully so, because there's a lot of guys that are in a shop that are just trying to make a paycheck. They're just trying to earn some money, especially right now. Times are tough. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a little, uh, it's a little tough to, uh, to just take some time out and and uh, uh, spend uh, spend time just collecting known goods for no reason. Uh, most of what I was just talking about was uh, at a headline screen here. It just said tools, advantages, and limitations. So I, I just want to say you guys didn't miss miss anything. You're, so you should see uh, a fluke multimeter and and a wiring diagram. Some words up there. Uh, Chuck, Chuck Morris, I have to watch how I pronounce that. I'm like a beat up. Uh, I don't understand the settings on a fluke meter. Uh, you're not alone. 
you're, you're absolutely not alone. I, and it's something I ask in my classes all the time. How many guys know what, uh, how many guys know what this knob is for? And I go, oh, yeah, volts, ohms, amps, things like that. I said, how about all these buttons at the top? And then, and then it's silence. Uh, the only way you're going to get good is practice is uh, get the owner's manual out or go online. I know it's all online now uh, and do a little research and play around. And, and what I was getting to with guys collecting known goods is maybe you got a car in your bay. You've already diagnosed it. It was simple, straightforward. Uh, it had a bad coil, it had a PO301. We did some, some coil swapping or whatever it is and, and you figured out the problem. Well, that car is sitting in your bay. You're waiting for a customer Approval, you're waiting for parts. That's a car with known good and known bad. Now is the ideal time to do some testing. If you don't have another car to work on, then you've got a chance to learn something. So, regardless of the tool, regardless of uh, the technique that we use, the the first goal in testing is understanding the circuit, identifying how the circuit works, taking a look at a wiring diagram, looking at description and operation. And if we understand the operation of the circuit, uh, the type of tool that's to be used might become obvious. We, we might realize, uh, oh, okay, the circuit's supposed to do this, and I know that my amp clamp or my scope or my multimeter is, is the best way to go, the fastest way to go. Uh, and we have to think to ourselves, what isn't this going to tell us? If I, if I use my amp clamp, and I'm going to give you an example here real quick, uh, what is it telling me about that circuit? Amperage is work. And if I am testing a simple series circuit, and I see amperage, I know the circuit's good. I, I, I see current flowing, something is happening. I don't have a broken wire and open in that circuit. And then in analyzing that wiring diagram, we might see our best place to do our testing. I don't wanna drop a fuel tank. I've never had a car with a bad fuel pump that had an empty tank. The only time the customer has ever brought me a car with a full tank is when the fuel pump was bad. So, uh, if I don't need to drop that fuel pump or drop that fuel tank to get access to the fuel pump wiring and do some testing, I'm, I'm all for it. My amp clamp allows me to be lazy. So I see a fuse and that fuse right there on the board gives me a spot to access the, uh, uh, to access the circuit. So I'm gonna jump here. Let's try this and see if everybody sees the screen change. Has everybody seen a circuit? Big blue screen with a circuit on it? Yes, okay, good. Uh, I've got a simple circuit here, series circuit. I've got a battery, a 12 and a half volt battery. Uh, I have a switch and I can turn this bulb on and off. And I guess what I should have done was put a, put a fuse in the circuit. Bear with me here for a second. We will revisit this circuit. So for those of you who are going, wow, that's cool. Yes, it's, it's very cool. And we're, we're going to talk about it uh, later on in the class here if we've got time. My amp clamp allows me to place the jaws around the wire and see the amount of current or the amount of work being done in the circuit. It doesn't matter where I put it. I get 1.21 amps. Around the bulb, if the jaws were big enough to go completely around the battery, I see the current is the same throughout the entire circuit. So my amp clamp, going to the fuse, putting a loop of wire there, will tell me if the circuit is doing work. But what if I have a broken wire? My current is zero. Do I know exactly where the problem in the circuit is? If you guys could answer on chat, not at all. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. What if I install a resistor? My current is lower. That resistor, which is resisting the flow of current, and uh, I misspoke last week, and, and thank you for Dick Krieger or last Wednesday. Uh, the current is not flowing slower. There's, there's less of it. The animation here shows it moving slower to indicate we have less current. But again, my amp clamp shows me there's work being done, but it doesn't show me where the problem is because the current is the same throughout the entire series circuit. 
Randy, I, I see your question and we're going to get to that in this class. Hopefully I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, but uh, bear with us here, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. All right, so we, we have to choose the right tool. We have to choose the right test. We have to know what it is telling us and what it isn't telling us. And uh, we're gonna start with, uh, I, I already said I like amp clamps, but by far my most favorite tool on the whole planet is the scan tool. Uh, some of you guys already know that. But the scan tool isn't going to fix everything, and, and it's rare that I'm going to diagnose the exact problem right from the driver's seat. As much as I love my scan tool, as much as there's an amazing amount of information there, if you have a trouble code, you have code set criteria, uh, if you research that properly, it may lead you to the type of test that you do or don't need to do. But even with newer scan tools, even with some of the amazing speed, of these newer scan tools, there, there's always a delay. There's always some issues. Has anybody run into any problems with their scan tool? Maybe data that was incorrect or, or old or, or any data PIDs or specific cars you've run into trouble with? I'll give, I'll give you one of my uh, examples while you're thinking about that. Uh, take a car for a test drive and graph the wheel speed sensors. I, I, I guarantee you that at some point you're going to come to a stop and still see the wheel speed sensors uh, 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 registering some speed. Wheel speed sensors provide information to the ABS module, and he has to process that and give that information to the PCM, and he has to process that and give it to the scan tool. Scan tool has to process it, put it up on the screen. So there's always going to be some delay, and, and Hans is, is perfect there. Yeah, scanner can only tell you what that module thinks is going on. Uh, <clears throat> maybe slow. Uh, Darren, you, you're right. Sometimes the Bluetooth connection on certain scan tools is, is a little slow. If uh, I know on my Autel, the uh, Ford uh, power balance test done wirelessly is terrible. But if I hook up the USB cable, it is crystal clear and it works fantastic. So again, knowing the limitations of your scan tool and what I have to do to get my good information out of it is, is important. It doesn't matter what brand it is. The data on your screen, air fuel sensor resistance. Uh, do, we think the, uh, do we think the PCM in the car is actually doing an ohms measurement? Do we think we have an ohm meter inside of our PCM? No. We got a couple of no's there. Yeah, no way. No, it's it's an inferred or calculated value. It is it is probably uh, measuring amper, amperage and and using Ohm's law to, to make that calculation. So again, we're we're just looking what the PCM or that particular module thinks is going on. So there are limits to our scan tool. Our multimeters, same thing. Uh, again, doesn't matter what brand it is. Uh, here we've got an amp clamp meter. Uh, on the left and our snap-on multimeter on the right. We're using a signal generator uh, set to about 100 hertz. And, oh, I jumped over it there. Uh, we're using our signal generator uh, set to 100 hertz and both meters are displaying 99.9 .9 hertz perfectly. Uh, they're working just fine. If I'm chasing a signal that has a uh, 100 hertz signal, both of these appear to uh, do that just fine. But if I crank our signal generator up to 150 hertz, the snap-on meter reading 149.9, dead on accurate. The amp clamp meter is reading 63 hertz. Turns out if we look at the specs for this amp clamp meter, it is meant for AC frequency. Now, it doesn't mean this meter is bad. It is the wrong tool for this particular test. Uh, Todd Doty, who's on our panel Monday and Wednesday night uh, has this meter and said that the amp clamp itself is amazingly accurate. The min-max function works fantastic. So this amp clamp is or amp clamp meter is a great tool for some tests, just not this one because above 100 hertz, it gets it seems to lose the signal. It's just not meant for that. Again, check your check your meter specifications. You will be very surprised if you own a fluke meter 
uh, the, the trigger levels required for picking up a frequency signal. If you have your fluke meter set to the wrong scale, it might be looking for a frequency to cross 40 volts. And I don't know of a car that has a, has a maybe a hybrid, but not beyond that, that has a signal that crosses 40 volts unless something has gone terribly wrong. We've got a uh, Craftsman multimeter on the screen, and we've cranked our signal generator up to 500 hertz. Our Craftsman meter reading 500 hertz uh, just fine. Both meters reading them just fine. If we crank our signal generator up to 110,000 hertz, our Craftsman meter goes to zero. Again, I'm not, I'm not bad mouthing the Craftsman meter. Uh, I sat in Gary Smith's class at Vision, and he said of all of the multimeters he owns, the Craftsman meters are some of the most accurate out there. So it's, it's not about the brand, it's about knowing what tool to reach for in a, in a particular test. So that brings us up to our, uh, our first question for you guys, or our first poll for you guys. I am chasing a problem in a 2015 Chevy Cruze, and it is a fuel-related issue. And in looking through description and operation, looking through wiring diagrams, I found that this car actually has a flex fuel sensor. I thought that this was something that older cars dealt with. And I, and I thought we were doing this with, with software now, but some of the newer GMs still may, it's, as it says there, if equipped, may have a flex fuel sensor. Inside the red box there, it says the ECM provides an internal pull-up to five volts on the signal circuit and the flex fuel sensor pulls the five volts to ground in pulses. That is huge and that is something you really need to pay attention to when you do your testing. What module is supplying the power? What module is providing the signal and how is he providing that signal? So that we go to measure it, we know what to look for, we know where to test. The normal range of operating frequencies between 50 and 150 hertz. 50 hertz representing zero ethanol, 150 representing 100% ethanol. So I've got this car in my bay. I've got all three multimeters we've talked about already sitting in my toolbox. Randy, if you could put, your, put that pole up there, let's give this a try. Based on the description and operation of the circuit, we are testing which multimeter would be the best to use based on the specs of the meter. Now, don't be afraid to answer. Again, it is anonymous. I'm not going to call anybody out. There are no wrong answers. Well, there, there may be wrong answers, but we're going to discuss that. Oh, I like this. How we see it coming up live there. Or I can see it coming up. We'll, sh we'll share the results by percentage as soon as we end the polling, which we'll do in about... Uh, Five seconds. It's interesting. I only saw the poll. I didn't see the data. Oh. Okay. And there's All right, our so, results. So there's our results. So, uh, let's see if I can. Overwhelmingly, everybody picked the, uh, the, the snap on meter. 71% picked the snap on meter. And, and you're absolutely correct. The snap on meter can handle a signal from 50 to 150 hertz. What about the Craftsman meter? The Craftsman meter could do up to 500. 500. So the Craftsman meter would work just as well for this particular test as the snap-on one. Uh, amp clamp meter, if I can back up here, let's give this a try. Do the po does the poll results stay up on the screen? Oh, I'll pull that down. No, 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 I'm, I'm just asking if there's, are they staying up there? They're, they are, they are now. They're covering okay. your meter though. Okay, that's fine, I'll, I'll uh, uh, remember on this particular screen when we brought the uh, signal up to 150 hertz, the amp clamp meter started to lose the ability to pick up the signal. It's just not built for that. So could the amp clamp meter pick up some of the signal? Absolutely. From 50 to 100, it, it, it might handle it. Uh, but if we had a car with a considerable amount of alcohol content or a sensor that was uh, a reading much higher uh, incorrect value, it, it might lose that signal. So, uh, 
again, it, it's a it's about picking up uh, the right tool for the job. It, it really doesn't matter what brand it is. All right. Which brings us into our next section here. Uh, open and short testing. So uh, normally at the beginning of my classes, I tell everybody I'm not that smart, uh, but electricity makes sense to me and it's always kind of made sense to me. And I know that's, that's, that's tough. It's, it's, not some, it's, it's something that we all struggle with. Uh, but my first job uh, at a dealership was AMC Jeep Eagle Renault Peugeot. I'm going to give you guys all a couple of seconds to groan about that. Uh, but it's living proof that I'm not that smart. I worked on Renaults and Peugeots, and I stayed in this industry. Uh, I'm 17 years old. I've got an 87 or 88 Jeep Wrangler that's uh, still under warranty, and it has a dead uh, blown fuse in it. Uh, you stick a fuse in it, and it instantly pops. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm right out of tech school. And uh, as much as I loved my instructor at tech school, uh, because it was my father, uh, he didn't teach me everything in the world. So uh, I was struggling with this one. How do I go after a short? And I go to our shop foreman and uh, he says, uh, oh, that's easy. Just stick a penny in there. And I thought, what? That's going to burn something up. He says, yeah, exactly. Just look for the smoke. If the smoke comes from under the hood, we change the engine harness. If it comes from anywhere else, we change the other harness. And at 17 years old, I thought, that's a really, really bad idea. It's only gotten to be a worse and worse idea. Please do not get me in trouble tomorrow or this afternoon and tell your boss, guess what I learned in the CTI class? That if we stick a penny in the fuse, we're going to find the smoke. We're going to let the smoke out of things really, really expensive. And uh, things have come a long way since 1987. Luckily, we have some slightly higher tech tools uh, that a penny to, to, uh, to go after uh, shorts and opens with. So what do you guys use? What do you like to uh, use to go after a, uh, a blown fuse, a dead short, or, or an open issue? You guys can answer on chat. Seeing bulb, multimeter. Bulb, multimeter. <laughs> uh, unplanned thermal <laughs> okay. event. All I, right, I, want to, I want to address that. Uh, Corey from SNA uh, was in our class on Monday. And he works for the New York City Transit Authority. And, and he said if a, if a fuse bop pops or blows or has a wiring problem, he cannot write the words fire on the repair order because a fire requires extra uh, uh, unnecessary paperwork. So they have to write thermal event, unplanned thermal event. I thought that was great. <laughs> uh, so we got a bunch of things in here, thermal imager, uh, short detector, multimeter, uh, fuse buddy, test light, buzzer or load or bulb across the fuse. Uh, we're, I'm going to try to talk a little bit about all of them. Uh, there are some specialty tools out there like the uh, Power Probe open and short finders that are just things we can't, we just don't have time to get to today. Uh, you, oh, let me put it up there. Let me ask you guys a question. Do fuses wear out? <laughs> this is always an interesting one. Do you guys think fuses wear out? Oh, we got a 50-50. Yeah. Yes and no right off the start. Okay. Yeah, no, no, that was interesting. No. no, no, no. Everything wears out. Well, Brian lives in Ohio, so yeah, everything just rusts away. They corrode. I, Randy, that is... What I have seen more than anything is they fail due to corrosion if they're, if they're not failing due to some unplanned thermal event. Yes, but not in any time limit that will likely affect our field. Good answer, Anthony. Yeah, it, overwhelmingly, yeah, when they blow, yes. <laughs> Great, Frank, when they blow, sure. More often than not, um, uh, we're dealing with blown fuses, so we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna discuss fuses wearing out. But, Chuck and a couple other people have said, I would think so due to hot and cold cycles. And it's, it's certainly a possibility, but again, that's, that's a description for another, discussion for another class. Uh, is there a way to test the circuit without wasting fuses? Yeah, of course, there's a cheap way. Just get a fuse, just get a penny, right? No, no, we do not, we do not want to put a penny in the circuit. One of, one of the options uh, that we 
we have available to us is the uh, Fuse Buddy. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's another company that has one called the Ampound, uh, as, as uh, somebody's already mentioned. Uh, they allow, they're resettable circuit breakers. And one of the nice things about these resettable circuit breakers is they're also going to provide us with the amperage flowing through the circuit. So in this instance here on your screen, we have a maxi fuse that is, uh, that is intermittently blowing or we're having an issue with this circuit. In uh, one of our earlier classes, somebody said, you know, these tools are more expensive than just a handful of fuses. Why not just do it that way? <laughs> Wait, wait till you get one of these Toyota Maxi fuses that blows and you find out it's $187 for a fuse. Uh, it, it'll get really expensive throwing, throwing fuses in there. And these Maxi fuses are, I, the last time I looked, $12 or $15 a pop. So that gets to be really expensive really fast. So we take our, take our fuse out. We install our adapter for our Max Fuse Buddy. This fuse... Uh, still goes into the circuit, so it is protected, but the Max Fuse Buddy itself also has a resettable circuit breaker. We can set the level in that circuit breaker. Uh, uh, in this instance, we're on a lighting circuit, and I'm sure that that Maxi Fuse powers more than just the lights, but this gives us the ability to turn on whatever that fuse protects, whatever circuit that fuse protects one at a time and, and look for a spike in current to try to catch the circuit we're, we're dealing with. In this case, we've got the parking lights on and we're drawing 4.8 amps. We turn the low beams on, it jumps up to 11.6 amps. We turn the high beams on, it goes up to 14.3 amps. We can continue turning circuits on and, and look for a spike in current. If we don't have a spike in current, if this is an intermittent problem, well, now we can start wiggling wires. We can, uh, maybe we need to power break the car, uh, get that engine twisting or turning and pulling on wires and, and look for a spike in, in current. If we're dealing with a, an open, maybe we have a circuit that isn't working, we could do the same thing. Install the fuse buddy, wiggle wires, uh, 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 manipulate the uh, harness and look for jumps or look for dropouts in that current to give us a location as to where that uh, uh, that circuit may be having issues. Looking for a dropout or or the, or the exact moment that that circuit is overloaded and pops. So this is just one example of a tool that might provide us with a with a direction as to where to continue our testing. What I like to do uh, is use my amp clamp. My amp clamp with those current loops, like I talked about at the very beginning of class, if there is a fuse available, I am gonna pull the fuse out, put a loop of wire in there, uh, put my amp clamp on it, and go to my U-scope, uh, go to my Vantage, go to my Pico, what, whatever I got handy, whatever I think I need for this particular test. This is just my personal opinion here, but I am not a huge fan of the OTC ones because of this huge plastic uh, connector right at the bottom. There are some fuse panels uh, that are just a nightmare. Uh, 2014 Lincoln MKZ is still fresh in my mind. I don't want to work on anymore. Uh, where I wouldn't be able to get this into some of the, some of the fuses just because of where they, they put it. It, it. There's nothing wrong with the tool. Uh, but the, uh, the AES wave style ones where they moved the fuse up off of the connector itself are, are fantastic. When I was at Vision, I made sure to grab this oddball weird one for those uh, three-pronged uh, Ford fuses. So now we can put our amp clamp anywhere on, on those particular circuits. And there were two others for the, the long and really stubby fuses. So uh, take a look at those. Uh, they work really great, and they're easy to get into a, uh, a fuse panel because you don't have that huge plug of uh, plastic at the very bottom of it. Excuse me. A couple of people mentioned a bulb, and that is a fantastic, uh, uh, quick, low-budget way of going after a short to ground. We have a fuse that's blown. Pull the fuse out. Install our bulb and our jumper wires where the fuse would go. If we have a dead short, the bulb is going to light up. The bulb is going to limit the current. We're not going to burn anything up. Now, take a look at a wiring diagram. We see 
what circuit that fuse feeds and we can disconnect things. We can, again, wiggle wires. We're looking for that bulb to flicker or go out to give us an indication as to where that short may be. A couple of people, I know Brian Collada and, and uh, uh, Keith DeFazio had said they use a buzzer along with the bulb. So they have an audible and a visual uh, maybe the fuse is in the front of the car and the wiring problem is in the trunk and, you know, listen for that buzzer instead of looking for the bulb would, uh, yeah. would work just fine. Uh, Rich, can I jump in here for just a second? Absolutely. Uh, for some of our audience out there that has uh, not done this or they've done it and don't really understand why it works, they just know it works. Uh, here's why it works. Uh, short by definition is bypassing the load in a circuit. And so by putting a bulb or a bulb and buzzer in that circuit, you're putting the load back in the circuit and making it a complete circuit again. Uh, what you're looking or what you've done with that short is turn it into a ground path. And so you can manipulate the wiring, um, you can uh, manipulate the component, whatever you need to do. And as soon as you eliminate that ground, the bulb goes out. So pretty simple if you boil it down to just basic circuit fundamentals. Absolutely, which which brings us to our our, our next poll here. Uh, pardon my animations here. This was uh, done in short order, but let's stay with this picture right here. Let's say that that car, and honestly, I don't know where that that fuse box is on this particular. I'm not sure the details, but the car comes in, and that fuse is blown. And you say to yourself, "Oh, Rich." told me this cool trick with the, with the bulb and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hook up my light bulb and let's see what happens. The fuse is already blown. I hook up my light bulb and uh, the bulb isn't lit up. Now what? Do I know anything about this circuit? Do I have any idea of exactly what's going on? Not, not really. And maybe I say to myself, okay, well, the bulb trick didn't work. Rich lied to me. Uh, oh, I got those, I've, I've got those uh, amp loops. Let me hook up a loop and hook up my amp clamp. And I hook up my amp clamp and I've got no amperage. So the car came in with a blown fuse and I'm not seeing any indications of current flow at this, problem, at this point. <laughs> um, I like some of the answers that are coming in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna address some of them, but bear with me. Based on what we know of the circuit so far, which honestly isn't, isn't a whole heck of a lot, what type of circuit fault do you suspect? And what tool and test would you use to prove your theory? So is it an open circuit and I'm gonna reach for my voltmeter, do a voltage drop test, open circuit, go for my scope, open circuit and grab my ohm meter, short circuit, again, going after voltage drop, short circuit, scope, short circuit ohm meter. We know we had a short that blew the fuse. I think I, I, the car came in with a blown fuse. Uh, at this point, we have no current flowing whatsoever. Uh, I, there's, a, there's a couple of different ways that we can go after this. Um, uh, can, can, I, can I chime in on something here, Rich? Absolutely. But, <laughs> Let me, let me ask a follow-up question. You basically have two groups of three answers. We either are saying we have an open circuit and we're going to select our next test, or we have a short circuit and we're going to select our next test. Um, I think where the confusion comes in is we say we had a short that blew the fuse because that's typically what blows a fuse. Yeah, yeah. I think. But I then when we, when we put a load in place of the fuse, it didn't light. So that indicates an open circuit. Um, so that would, that would lead to a confusing response in the test. Mm -hmm. um, so for those who selected a thinking that we currently have a short circuit when we didn't get any current flow with a substitute load, can you have a short circuit with zero amps of current and a load in there, or must the circuit be open and incomplete? How would you, 
how would you split those two conditions in your head? This question kind of leads us into our, our next, uh, our, our next uh, section here. But uh, yeah, I, again, with what Jim said, I would say, yeah, at this point, we, we, have a, uh, we have an open circuit and that voltage drop or, or even a continuity test might, might be uh, in store here. So I, I think there was more than one right answer here. I'm, I'm just so happy so few people said scope, but that's just me. Power testing and voltage drop. Uh, there's nothing wrong with an ohm meter for a continuity test. And, and maybe that is a warranted test at this point on that particular circuit. But as one of my guys in North Carolina said, an ohm meter can only tell you if the circuit is bad. Uh, it, it cannot tell you if the circuit is good. An ohm meter does not load the uh, circuit properly to give us any indication as to whether that wire or that component we're testing can, can flow current. So uh, we want to do voltage drop testing. Excuse me. Uh, again, there's a, there's a bunch of different tools that we can do for this type of testing. Uh, I have one of them here that I know has a built-in circuit test. Uh, I, I know the power probes have their circuit tests, and, and there are some pluses and minuses to, to this type of tool. Uh, on Monday, I said, man, this thing is huge. And uh, I wasn't a big fan of it when I first started playing around with that. I couldn't imagine going under the dash and trying to get into a tight uh, uh, engine bay with it. And uh, somebody had pointed out that the connections are banana clips so that I could take an adapter or, or a jumper wire and I could take my OEM style connectors or, and, and tap into a circuit and not need to stick this under the hood or in the engine so again, just know how to use your tools. Voltage drop issues are, they're, they're gonna burn up motors, uh, they're gonna cause dim lights, they're gonna cause solenoids and actuators to not work properly. And uh, they are going to cause repeat failures. Car comes in with a burnt up fuel pump before we just throw a new fuel pump in it drop that completely full tank and change the fuel pump. Uh, I, I want to make sure the circuit is good because I, I don't want to turn that circuit into a serial killer that just keeps killing fuel pump after fuel pump. I want to, I want to fix the, uh, uh, the circuit first and replace the fuel pump once. So voltage drop testing finds the hidden resistance in the circuit. Now, uh, I'm going to jump back to that animation. You guys should have that, that circuit back on the screen. Uh, so we've got a light bulb. Uh, there is a resistance in the circuit. We, we still have a resistor in the circuit there. And we want to do a voltage drop test. We grab our voltmeter. And I'm just going to move the current meter up out of the way here. Amp clamp out of the way here. <coughs> Take my voltmeter, and I go to my battery. And I see that my battery has 12.5 volts. What would I expect my voltmeter reading to be at the bulb itself? No, well, I just gave that away, didn't I? If I have a 12.5 volt battery and I'm gonna, and I'm going to do voltage drop across the bulb, what would I expect voltage wise? Chuck says source voltage. Source voltage. Uh, slightly re less less than battery voltage you know what let's get the let me get the resistor out of there for just one second and make this a good circuit <laughs> what i expect to see is very close to source voltage now there's a little bit of resistance in the circuit which is normal uh but close to source voltage now With my resistor in place, I see considerably less than source voltage. The beautiful thing about a voltage drop test is that if we can get to the load, if, if it is accessible to us, I only need to move one lead to get a direction. Because right now, there's 12.5 volts at the battery. There's only 11 at the bulb or dropping across the bulb, indicating I have resistance, I have another load 
in the circuit. I need to know where is that load because doing voltage drop across the load tells me there's resistance in the circuit. It doesn't tell me where. And I could put this resistor anywhere in the circuit. Uh, but if I take one lead and move it over to the battery, and I see that my voltage drop there is the same as it is right here, what do I know about that circuit? You know what? Let's get this a little better here. My voltage drop across the bulb, I'm losing about a little over a volt. My voltage drop from the positive side of the battery across the bulb, I'm still losing a little over a volt. Is my problem on the feed side of the circuit or the positive side of the circuit? All right, good. We got a couple of people answering. No, we know the feed side of the circuit is fine. It's on the ground side. And again, it's just a matter of moving my leads. Ah, I should have. And I see that voltage drop. And then I move it. And I move it. And I am dividing and conquering. And eventually, I'm going to get to the other side of that circuit. And my voltage drop disappears. My problem is in between this point and this point. And if I have analyzed my wiring diagram accurately, and I've looked for the easy spot to do this testing, I may very, very quickly pinpoint the exact location of our resistance or our issue. Now, for those of a couple of people who had asked, and I know we shared the link, uh, this is the Colorado gym, physics and education, is it? This, yeah, this is, Jeff already put it up in chat, but this program is free to students and educators around the country. If you go to the link that Jeff put up in the, in the chat, look for that. The physics education department at the University of Colorado Boulder makes a bunch of simulations available excuse me, most of them have been converted over to HTML5. They're, they're no longer JavaScript. Um, yes, Jeff or uh, Rich is about to create a fire. Go ahead and make a fire. You know you want to. That's oh, not a blue. fire. That is an you, unplanned thermal event. We had an unplanned thermal event at the fuse location. Um, I don't like to use fuses. I, I rather have the fire. Um, <laughs> but anyway, the, the, the program is free to use and it's even free for educators like us, as long as we give credit for where the program comes from. The beauty of this is that anyone that's here can go and download these HTML files and put them on your PC or your tablet and you can practice and you can learn to build a circuit and, um, all right. Quick show of hands. How many guys that are on the chat right now uh, in school were not really fond of math and science? Raise your hands for that. You got them popping up. As a percentage of the group, that's pretty small right now. And that's, I realize some of y'all may be eating a sandwich because it's lunchtime or whatever. Um, Math, no. Science, yes. Uh, overthinker. <laughs> Science, yes. Math, meh. Okay. I, I, like, I like the chat responses, too. Um, the funny thing about it is, you know, this is electricity, and we've all said in our training that um, nowadays, as a technician, we have to know electricity. We've got to understand it. We've got to know how to test it. And this is part of the physics department. So yes, folks, we are dealing with physics. Sorry. <laughs> and that goes for brakes. And that goes for everything. Everything. As a matter of fact, I, I would often draw a, <clears throat> an electrical circuit, a series circuit with one fixed and one variable resistor. And on the fixed resistor, I would place this voltmeter. And on the variable resistor, I'd be able to turn it up so high that basically no current was flowing. And 
I would say, do you understand how this works? And as I would increase flow on the variable resistor, you would change the voltage drop from zero to something across the fixed resistor. And they'd be like, okay, yeah, I get that, I get that. I said, that's how a Ford DPFE works because it's all the same concepts. And so once we understand it, it just gets easier across everything. We have a couple of really good pertinent questions in chat. I, um, one is that wiring diagrams can sometimes be confusing how to find the easiest going. points to do a voltage drop. Yep. Uh, and the next one is right under that. Do you have okay. to disconnect the load to find out? Uh, no, we're about to get to, well, let me get to both of those. Robert, uh, wiring diagrams are confusing how to find the easiest points to do the voltage drop test. Um, yes, they are. And, and just like using your tools, it's, it's going to take practice and every manufacturer has gone to their own global style of wiring diagram. It's not getting any easier. Uh, in your service information is a description of the symbols. Um, Again, there is a bunch of great classes. One of my favorite classes to ever take is George Menchu's wiring diagram class. Um, it's it's going to take practice uh, with those wiring diagrams to get comfortable with them. When I started working for Mercedes, it was DIN style wiring diagrams, and that was it. And it took me a while to make sense out of them. And once it clicked, I went, oh my God, I like these so much more. I prefer them. Uh, but... Um, yeah, it's just, you're going to have to do your research. You're going to have to take your time. My, my, my best tip with a wiring diagram can be start with what you know. Start with, oh, that's a fuse, or oh, that's the, that's the load, and work your way from there. The nice thing about electricity is BMW electrons flow the same way as Ford electrons do. So if you can identify the symbols and you know that that fuel pump or window motor needs power and ground, you can you can work from there uh that that is uh uh that is uh, uh we have a couple of different classes that cover wiring diagrams so that's that's a great one that i think we could do uh as a webinar so i'll do my best to get that one out to you too guys all right um the the other question was um do we always have to disconnect the load to find out no um maybe i'm misunderstanding that question there we don't want to disconnect the load. When we do voltage drop testing, the circuit has to be working. Um, so use the component as the load, the bulb, the motor, whatever it may be. If that component isn't working or has already failed, we want to substitute a load. Uh, Randy, am I, am I missing part of that question? Or not really? Oh, I, I, th I think you're close. Um... What we have to remember is that that, uh, that circuit has to be operating to make a valid uh, voltage drop test. If there's no current flow, you're not going to see any voltage drop at all, uh, which can lead you down the garden path all by itself. So if you're, let's say, for example, you're replacing a fuel pump that's not working and you want to test that wiring before you put it all back together, you have to substitute a load that's equivalent to that fuel pump in the, uh, in the circuit. So we have current flowing through that circuit so we can make a valid, uh, valid voltage drop test. So it does have to work. Uh, let me throw just a quick question out there. If I'm new to voltage drop testing and I uh, do a voltage drop test, let's say we go across the positive side of the circuit to try to get direction. Uh, so from battery positive all the way back to our fuel pump uh, feed circuit. We'll still pick on fuel pumps here. And my meter reads 0, 0.000 volts. Do I have a perfect circuit or do I have a problem? Okay. You guys can answer in chat or we'll, we'll let Rich expound on that. Bill Hamilton got it right. Darren, you're right. You got a problem. If we test voltage drop and we do not have any voltage drop, then we don't have current flow. If current is flowing, we will have resistance in the circuit. doesn't matter if they're gold-plated uh, monster wires or, or whatever it may be. So uh, there's always going to be some voltage drop in a circuit that is working. Um, all right. So I see I'm running out of time. A lot of guys have run out of lunch, so we kind of need to 
jump here for a little bit. Give me a couple more minutes, guys, if you can. If not, thank you very much for attending. Um, it's possible that that voltage drop may occur after the circuit heats up, after it's been operating for a while. Uh, and if we don't have a component that we can put in there and leave in there, we might have to uh, substitute a load. One of the things that we suggest is some type of a load box. Again, I know there are tools out there that will simulate a load on a circuit. Uh, one of the things about this one is that it lets me be cheap and I make it myself. Uh, but we just have a simple box here, and all six bulbs are hardwired in, in uh, parallel to the uh, banana connectors. So we can use our adapters to hook this into a circuit, and based on 12.4 volt battery, we see that uh, we can adjust the load depending on how many bulbs we put in. From from one to six bulbs, we can vary that that uh, that uh, amperage from 2.5 amps up to about 15 amps. If it's less than two and a half amps, that's what my old school incandescent test light is, is good for because it draws about an amp. So match the load to the circuit. If, if we're chasing a marker light bulb, we probably don't want to flow 15 amps through that circuit. So just uh, uh, use that load test box to substitute the appropriate amount of load on the circuit so that we can test it. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, I am running out of time here, which we knew was going to happen. Uh, we, we have some discussions in this class about using the power probe and applying power and ground to a circuit. The power probe is a fantastic tool when used properly. Uh, I, I can't stress that enough because in some instances, that button there on the top could very easily be labeled the kill ECM button. If you are going to apply power or ground, you better know very well the type of circuit that you are applying power and ground to. And the power probe has some pretty neat features where it can tell you uh, it, it tripped the circuit breaker, it flew a certain amount of amperage here, we're activating a fuel pump. Um, again, if, if you have one of these tools, know how to use it, know how to uh, uh, operate it properly. Frank is 100% correct. It is super dangerous if handled incorrectly. Uh, a lot of people love their power probes. Uh, a lot of people have already realized where it excels and where it really struggles with, with some of its testing. So just be careful. Uh, my, my last thing that I'm going to, that I'm going to jump to here is, is amp clamp testing. And, and I'm, I just want to put one screen on, on the board here for you. And if you guys just give me about five more minutes, we'll get through our last poll here and our, our last question. Amp clamp tells us the amount of work being done by that circuit. By, by attaching your amp clamp to a scope, uh, again, U scope, uh, a Vantage, uh, uh, Autel scope, it doesn't matter. Uh, we see a lot of information. In the case of this window motor, we see the huge inrush of current as that electric motor built a huge magnetic field to get that window moving. So my, my last question here is, I've got a car in the door. Uh, the customer's complaint is that the driver's side window doesn't work. Uh, where's the easiest place for, our, for us to put our amp clamp to test this particular window circuit? Where would you guys go to? To the switch? To the fuse. Greg got it. Yeah, Greg got it. A couple of people got it. I'm lazy. I said it. I, I don't know if I said it at the beginning of the class, but I said it at all my classes. I, I'm lazy. I want to do as little work as possible. If I go to the battery, if my amp clamp has big enough jaws like that, that amp meter did to go around the battery cable, if I hit a switch, I should see a reaction. Uh, I don't want to pull the, the switch out. I might have to take the door panel to get to that. I don't want to look for the fuse or the relay. I don't want to tear that door jam uh, 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 sleeve apart. So if I go right to the battery, I can get some information. Now, customer's complaint is the driver's door, uh, driver's window doesn't work. What should I do first? Should I hook up my amp clamp and operate that driver's door? Or could I look somewhere else?
Look at the interior lights dimming. Yeah. Test the passenger door first. That's, that's really what I was looking for. Yeah. I've had a lot of guys answer that. Look at the dome light. You're, yeah. You're looking, you're looking at a reaction from uh, the, the current draw. We're just going to use our, our scope. Uh, but that, yeah, that is the old school way of going after it. So let's just say on our particular car, the blue, the blue waveform you see right now is our known good. That is the passenger window. That's what it should look. Draws about 18 amps, and once the window starts moving, that amperage drops down to about two and a half. Uh, the pattern looks good. Again, that's subject for another class as to what we're really analyzing here. So now I have something to compare it to, and I operate my driver's window. And when I hook up my amp clamp or when I turn the key on, I see my amperage is very close to zero. I hit the switch and the amperage very quickly, whoops, climbs up, stays up until I let go of the switch. This is our, our last poll. Randy, if you could pop that up there. A couple of you guys are, are realize what you're looking at. We're gonna ask you to answer that in the, uh, on the, on the uh, poll that should be on your screen now. Based off the results of our amperage test, what is the most likely circuit failure? So component failure because the circuit is operational was uh, the overwhelming winner there. Yeah, we see low current. When I hit the switch, it climbed up to that 18 amps. What does this tell us about the circuit? It's, it's working, isn't it? It's trying its best to do something. But it stays high until I let go of the switch. Would, uh, let's, let, let me ask this question then. Let's say the regulator was broken or the gear inside of the motor was stripped. Would my current climb up to 18 amps? Should it? If the motor was spinning freely, we should see a nice even pattern, but it should be very, very low. So <laughs> this waveform, which I know is very, very basic, could, uh, uh, yeah, it, there could be a couple of different things. If the regular cable is bound around the motor, if the motor is locked up, or like Brian said, if it's winter in Ohio and the glass is frozen to the door, that's never enters my mind down here in Florida anymore. Uh, but uh, yeah, it could be component failure. It could be an indication the motor itself is stuck. Is it a circuit problem? Do I have high resistance? Do I have an open in the wiring? No, we're getting a we're getting a couple of a couple of no there's no's there. So the car is in my door. I have popped the hood. I've put an amp clamp around the battery, uh, and I know I have a mechanical type problem. I have something that is uh, that is that is keeping this motor from spinning properly. I do not have an electrical problem. I don't need to do voltage drop testing. Uh, I, I have enough information to go to the service writer and say, hey, I need to pull the door panel and I need to see what's going on with the motor itself or we need to let the car thaw out if it's in, if it's in Ohio. Uh, but I, I have an answer very quickly. And if the customer declines any repairs, I don't have to put the car back together. Or if, if the customer declines any further diagnostics, we've done a total of five minutes of, of testing here and, and we have uh, the information we need. Uh, in order to go further or to give us a direction with the rest of our testing. So that type of testing can be applied to other circuits. Uh, the, uh, again, with fuel pump and other circuits, we can, we can get that information. And hopefully in future classes, we'll have the time to go into this a little bit further. But uh, we've, we've gone well over our time. I want to thank everybody for stay, sticking with me for a couple of uh, extra minutes here. Greg, uh, how much to charge for this test? That is... That is really up to you. Uh, 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 charge appropriately, because we should not be giving diagnostics away. But that, that's that's about as far as I'll, I'll go there. Uh, keep in mind our website for future classes. Uh, and uh, check our Facebook page. And uh, look at all the uh, webinars available out there, because there's a lot of good training coming your way.